on The Gadget Show. Dallas and I face a very extreme and very physical challenge, testing rugged camcorders, surfing simulators and very scary downhill mountain bikes. And John puts a trio of the latest sexy media centre PCs through their paces to see which one you should have nestling under your telly. Amulet. Play artist Amy Winehouse. Hello and welcome to The Gadget Show. This week's show is a juggernaut packed full of exciting gadget fare. <gasps> and I'm particularly excited about the challenge. Oh, so am I. Why are you excited? Because in this week's challenge, <laughs> I could not lose because I'm not in it. <laughs> <laughs> this week's challenge is an extreme sports-based challenge between our two rather handsome young bucks on the gadget show, Jason Bradbury and Dallas Campbell, locking horns, going head to head. Thank you very much. OK, so we, we donned our thermal underwear, our mums gave us a packed lunch each, and off we went to Wales. We're here to test action cameras, the kind of devices you strap to your helmet when you want to do something really stupid. Record it for posterity and then walk away, hopefully, unscathed. Yeah, these things have to be able to go anywhere and record anything. Now, we've got the two <laughs> best on the market, but are they tough enough for what we've got in store? <laughs> oh! 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 oh. For our extreme test, I'd got the tough Vio POV1 helmet camera with 2 gig SD card, AA battery powered recording unit, and built in monitor. The recorder can be submerged to 1 meter, while the camera head is waterproof to 10 meters. And I got the VCAM, a fully sealed high speed head cam and recorder with a non removable 8 gig flash drive. With a rechargeable lithium ion battery, the VCAM will work up to a depth of 100 meters. If you buy one of these cameras, you'll want it to be tough and just keep on recording whatever you throw at it. So to test our cameras to the extreme, we were going to be doing something pretty extreme. We were going co-steering. Co-steering is rock climbing, cliff jumping, swimming and diving all thrown together in a big mess of extreme action. As clambering around the coast is a risky business, we'd got local guides Tim and Byron to keep us safe. No. Ow! <laughs> I feel bonded now. <laughs> and first, we were going to test waterproofiness. Both these units claim to be waterproof, and they'd need to be. The salty seawater would play havoc with the electronics if it got in. <laughs> the fact that my VCAM is solid state means that no parts can be removed. It's a sealed unit, so it should mean there's nowhere for the water to get in. My POV has waterproof military spec connectors and the port covers for the batteries and SD card have plastic seals that create a suction when pushed together. That means it can be underwater for about half an hour at a time without a problem. After a bit of a swim, we ended up in a whirlpool known as the washing machine, where we were buffeted by swirling sea and our camcorders got a serious drenching. <laughs> Even after two hours at sea, both our camcorders were showing no signs of water penetration. Both had passed the waterproof test. <laughs> On to the next part of the challenge. We wanted to test how tough the cameras are and to see just how much physical abuse they could withstand. To test the camera's toughness, we would be climbing along the extremely rough base of a jagged cliff. The cameras would get squashed, bashed and scraped. This sort of treatment would be terminal for any normal camcorder. It's like cliffhangers. My VCAM's case is covered in a nickel-coated carbon fibre for extra strength, and because it's solid state, there are no moving parts to skip or jump. However, in reality, after a few bashes, the picture froze and remained like that until I noticed and reset the unit. Very disappointing. My POV also claims to be shockproof. The recorder is made from toughened acrylic plastics and the camera head has no loose pieces inside it. Unlike Jason's V-cam, despite the punishment I gave it, it kept on going. In all seriousness, you have to the boat's stuck. The boat's stuck. So, in the toughness test, the clear winner was Dallas's POV. My V-cam just kept on stopping, which just wasn't good enough. Finally, we headed up the rock face for the big, dramatic final test. Waiting for us was a 40-foot leap into the swirling sea below. This was our big moment, exactly the sort of thing you'd buy these cameras to record. Fail here, and they'd be worse than useless. Yeah. 
This is scary, isn't it? Oh my god. This is actually oh, scary. Oh, oh. I'm not even heights, I'm not so good. Terrible, this is really, really scary. Come to me, Dallas, come on over. Well, I'm ready to do this. Are you ready to do this? Yeah. Come on, boys. Please. You'll be Come going on, here. Chase. On the count of three, here we go. You ready? Come on. Three, Chase. two, one, go! Yay! Yeah. Yeah. I'd done it. I'd made the jump, but had my camera recorded it? The VCAM had survived the impact and kept on recording. The footage was clear and constant. My only criticism, if I'm being picky, is that it was a tiny bit grainy. Now it was Dallas's turn. Oh, Dallas, hang on, baby. I want to feel you coming down. I had Three, never been so nervous. Two, one, go! <laughs> I'd done it, and I was still alive. But could the same be said for my camera? Yes, the POV had recorded it all, and the footage was perfect. Now I could show my friends how tough I really am. Wow, I get it, I get it! Oh, what a fantastic challenge! It looked absolutely terrifying. I'm still having nightmares about it was, that jump. It was, it was really, really high. high. Hey, you know what? And these yeah. pieces of kit, they really did seem to work, didn't they? Absolutely everything that yeah. you threw out there. They was really great. did. You know, this technology has moved on. There were a few glitches. My unit, for example, I don't know if you remember, I was bashing it against the side of the yeah. cliff. It actually stopped. Recording at that point, it froze, and I didn't realise until I'd finished that it had done that. Oh, that's quite irritating. So you don't want that to happen, no. do you? What about yours, Dallas? I thought it was pretty good. Essentially, both of them got the footage we wanted. My main glitch was because of the batteries. This takes standard AA batteries, mm. which kept running out, which is obviously not very handy in an outdoor situation. OK, but the important question here is which camera delivered the best footage? Yeah, yeah. So let's go and have a look, because we've got two identical televisions set up over here uh, with the footage, so we can compare. Take a seat, chaps. Okay. <sighs> okay, so Jason's VCAM is on the left okay. and Dallas's POV is on our right. All right, so instantly, I think that the colours on the VCAM are stronger than the POV, aren't they? But it is a bit pixelated, that picture. It's yeah, a bit jagged around the edges on the face and the helmet, isn't it, in the close-up? Yeah. Yeah. Especially in sort of in the, where, the, where the light hits the rock there, for example, where, the, where there's bright lights, it's, it struggles yes, to cope. Yes, exactly. The POV is a nice picture to watch, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's, it's a lot softer, whereas, the, you know, that one is a bit grainy. Yeah. So I think that's easier on the eye. I think the bottom line is with both. If you got home, you, would you be happy with both? I think you would. Yeah. I think you would. Yeah, but the thing is about these, the POV is pretty much half the price. I know. Of the VCAM. And that's got to be a deciding factor. And I think yours kept cutting out, so ultimately the winner of this challenge is the POV, and Dallas takes the first part. Oh. Right, time for a break now, but after that... John tests a trio of the best media centre PCs you could choose to put in your living room. And their extreme sports challenge continues as Dallas and I go head-to-head -head in a radical surf simulator smackdown. Welcome back. Now, I want to talk to you about Media Center PCs, computers designed to plug into your telly and look after all your multimedia needs. You can record TV, play music and films, and at the same time do everything a standard desktop can do. Thirty years ago, Bill Gates said he wanted to see a PC in every home. Now it seems the aim is to see a PC in every living room. Yet so far, the concept of the Media Centre PC hasn't exactly taken the world by storm. Mostly they've been noisy, expensive behemoths. But have things changed? I decided to try out three of the latest Media Centre PCs to see if they deserved a place in my living room. The three I've got cover what I reckon are all your options. The custom build, the off-the-shelf option and the luxury model. And I'm going to be testing each for usability, performance and finally for looks. First up, the custom build option. This is from Shuttle, who provide the rather sleek PC case and then you can specify your own requirements for the components to go inside it. This one's powered by an Intel Core 2 Duo processor. It has 500 gigabytes of hard drive space, a built-in Blu-ray drive for high-def playback and a digital tuner card. It comes with a fairly conventional remote, though you have to provide your own keyboard. I've got it here on the internet. Really, it's just like using a normal PC. 
The shuttle uses the media center interface on Vista, making it easy to browse all your media, from TV to music and photos. The Blu-ray player is certainly <sighs> useful, though I found I needed to play my Blu-ray disc through some additional software. There we are, a Blu-ray movie. Why can't they make it easier? And when it comes to watching and recording TV, there's plenty of hard disk space, but only one Freeview digital tuner. So there are pros and cons to the Media Center experience. Also, I don't think this Freeview picture quality is quite as good as I'm used to. And there's one major consideration when putting a PC in your living room, operating noise. They seem to have done a good job at controlling the fan noise on this shuttle, but the hard drive is actually really quite noisy when it's recording. It sounds like a small kettle in here chattering away. Hmm. Well, a solid, if unspectacular, start from the shuttle. A little too noisy and let down by its solitary tuner. Time to try out my off-the-shelf option, the new Sony VAIO VGX TP3. It looks like a much more designed product. It actually looks rather like a, a, a small cake tin or a sort of hat box. It also, though, has essentially exactly the same specification as the shuttle. It also comes with its own purpose-designed remote, and in this case, you get a keyboard thrown in as well, complete with a battery indicator to tell you whether you're running out. As with the shuttle, the media centre interface was very easy to navigate, and the input's easily accessible under a front panel, allowing me to instantly view my photos in full-screen glory. In terms of performance, the Sony, like the shuttle, only has one TV tuner, but on the plus side, my Blu-ray disc played with a little less fuss this time. It also sounds better as well. The Sony also coped well with accessing video content from the web and displaying it full screen, one of the major advantages of having a PC under your telly. It's interesting that the Sony's really very quiet. It's definitely quieter than the shuttle. It's got this special floating drive mount in it, which helps keep those hard drive noises to a minimum, and it seems to work. The Sony's smooth operation puts it just ahead of the shuttle so far, but how about my high-end choice, the Amulet? There are lots of differences with this one. It's much bigger, it's much more expensive, it's got a 750 gigabyte hard drive, it's got a touchscreen display on the front, but potentially, best of all, it does this. Amulet. Play artist Amy Winehouse. I said potentially. Let's try again. Play artist Amy Winehouse. Play artist Amy Winehouse. Play artist Amy Winehouse. <laughs> yes, in theory, the Amulet's voice recognition system should allow you to control your music, bring up TV channels and scroll through your DVDs. Uh, However, in practice, I found it didn't always want to play ball. Silence! Amulet! Silence! Hmm. Easier to train the dog to do it. Of course, you could always just use the remote to operate the media centre, and there are additional features on the touch screen, though that wasn't particularly reliable either. Ah. The Amulet does have space for more than 5,000 CDs, 30,000 photos and 100 hours of TV, has built-in software to store your DVD collection and is the only one with two tuners. But no Blu-ray player and an unreliable user experience are big drawbacks in my book. So, we've put the three media centre PCs through their paces, but there's one final and very important test. If you're going to put a PC in your living room, it's got to look right. And to find out which one really looks best, I'm going to invite in some discerning members of the public. What we want you to tell us is which one you think's the best to look at. The Sony. The Sony one. Let's do the Sony one. Uh, I'd have to agree. I think once something that's going to be able to fit into a smaller space. Those two are just too chunky. That looks, like, really old as well. It's, like, too huge. The Sony, yeah, definitely looks It's very sleek, very sexy. Um, it would be a nice addition to my apartment. Mm. Oh, right. Well, John, you did seem to have rather varying experiences with the multimedia PCs. Yes, there. some are definitely better than others, although they all feel like computers rather than boxes you can put under the TV and just forget about. OK, G ratings. Mm, two Gs for the amulet, definitely the worst, I think, because it's so expensive and so many of its features just don't deliver. And what's this obsession with voice recognition? It so rarely works on gadgets, does it? That's true. I often think it's just my accent, but I'm, I'm glad to hear that you have <laughs> problems too. <laughs> well, I've got an accent as well. <laughs> Moving well, swiftly on. How about this one? The shuffle, I'd give three Gs to that. Um, it, it's not the easiest of them to use, and also it lacks basic features like you'd find on even the cheapest Freeview PVR. 
And to the Sony, then, the one that all your friends in that apartment thought was very attractive. Mm, yes, four Gs for the uh, Veo, because I think it's, it's the most finished of the products. It, uh, it's the one you can most happily live with in your living room. OK, so the Gadget Show's favourite multimedia centrepiece is the Sony Veo. Suze, you've got to come and look at this. You're going to love it. What is it? The perfect accessory for you and your cameras. But oh. first, do that thing you need to get the lights down. Oh. OK, it's called the Optoma Pico Projector. It's the world's smallest commercially available projector. Look at that. Yay! OK, it's a fully functional DLP projector. It uses an LED light source. <gasps> OK, so it's very low power consumption. I know, you love it, don't you? I've been you? waiting for this I know you out. have. Whack that into the, uh, the AV yep, source there. Um, I'll start this video of John. OK. All right, and we should get an image pretty <gasps> quickly. This screen, OK, is the yeah. perfect accessory for it. It actually folds up smaller than a CD in size. And look at the quality of that image. Look at that. You've got focus on the side, which you can play with. I mean, we've put the lights down, but not massively. I mean, that's a very good quality image, isn't it? It really is. Yeah, and actually, you don't have to have a screen, do you? I mean, you, don't. you could project it just onto a wall. Yeah, or... just onto someone's back. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, can you imagine, you're just coming down off the mountain and you're with your snowboarding mates, you know, you get your helmet cam off, you'll sit in your chalet, have a drink and watch the movie. But guess what? what? It gets better. It's actually capable of turning the image from its iPod Touch or a Nokia phone or a camcorder a hundred times the size. Let me demonstrate with this other fabulous portable screen. Look out. There we go. Very Step back a little bit, Susie. Yeah. We should be able to get about 60 inches out of that. You do need to adjust the focus a little bit, and obviously it would help if the lights were down more, but you get the effect. Look at that. Yeah. There you go. Isn't that amazing? That's absolutely Can you imagine amazing. what it's going to do for, like, presentations? People wanted to do What about battery power, then, for OK, like? so because it's LED, obviously, it's um, very, very efficient, so you get two hours out of the battery. Fantastic. And the bulb life is good for 20,000 hours, which is more than enough for the lifespan of a gadget like this. I love it. It's brilliant, isn't it? OK, it's out this month. Is it? Yeah, and it's a Gadget Show World TV exclusive. Oh, well, you know what? I love it. But you might want to think about just how much you admire this little device, or any device, in fact, that has come out this year, because we are looking for the gadget of 2008. Yeah, are you a fan of the iPhone, or perhaps Rock Band, mm -hmm. or, or John, who loves Sony's new uh, OLED TV? Yeah, we want you to do more than think about it, though. We want you to tell us the Gadget Show's Gadget of the Year. Yep, so just go to our website, 5.tv slash Gadget Show. You'll see on the homepage a headline, uh, Gadget Show's Gadget of the Year. Give it a click. There's a, a short list there of ten gadgets that we've all put together. All you've got to do is decide which one you think is best. Yep, it is as simple as that. And you could find yourself winning that entire shortlist in our special online competition. And then we're going to announce the Gadget Show's Gadget of the Year that you have chosen in our Christmas show in December. Right, now it's time for the focus group. Each week on The Gadget Show, John, Jason and I present the best gadgets we can find in a particular category to our focus group, and they tell us which one they like the best. Now, this week, as you can see, we are surrounded by beautiful <laughs> beauty therapists because we're looking at stress-busting gadgets. And, John, you can go first. I've got the Alpha Stim Stress Control System, which is basically a little 9-volt battery-powered box that gives you tiny electric shocks to uh, de-stress you. And Jane has very kindly agreed to uh, demonstrate it. You put those little things on your earlobes, and then little tiny electric currents go through when I switch the button on here. Now, they recommend you start low and then increase it. So I'm on, on setting one. Are you feeling anything? Not yet. I'm on two now. Feeling... Stay there. Stay there, <laughs> stay there. <laughs> stay there. Stay there. Okay. I have it on maximum myself, but that's just because I'm far too stressed, to I think. Yes, you can go to three. Yeah. Good. So essentially, it gives you that little sort of... But what does it feel like? It's just like small pulses. Ah, yes, that's what they should be. And it shouldn't be painful or anything no, like that. It should, it should have a relaxing effect. Nobody knows exactly how it works, but what it does is it apparently stimulates activity both locally and at the base of your brain, which causes various chemicals to be produced, which makes you nice and relaxed all over your body. Four. Do it. Do it, yes! <laughs> <laughs> My stress-busting gadget makes use of oxygen, OK? It's called the Tranquil Sounds Oxygen Bar, and we've probably all heard about the regenerative effects of oxygen, but this brings it into the home, OK? In an affordable, simple-to-use package that also plays lovely music, as you can hear. It's quite simple with the technology. The oxygen comes out of this pipe and Natalie, who is my subject, is breathing it in as the, as the breeze flows over your nostrils and mouth. How, how's it making you feel right now? Relaxed. And the music is nice. 
It's quite, quite tranquil, but it's there really to hide the sound of the compressor that's buzzing in the background. And what the compressor is doing is creating a vacuum uh, which in turn draws air over an oxygen-enriched membrane. And that um, brings 30% oxygen down this tube and into Natalie's nostrils. Ladies, get set for the mind spa. Now this works by engaging your brain and then setting your brain frequencies to promote a complete state of relaxation or complete focus. Now this is how it works. You've got the central unit just here and you have to wear these glasses. Inside the glasses are some little LEDs. You can see that they're pulsating and this is what the brain frequencies tune into. And this blue one is, is to make you very calm. So you pop those on and you pop your earphones in to listen to some music. And the idea is it's slowing down your brain frequency and just allowing you to completely de-stress. It's quite calming, actually. When you close your eyes, it actually feels really relaxing. So you've got the blue lights there for complete relaxation. But if you want to completely focus and, and be really on the ball, then if we just switch these over, you can see that those lights are white. That's the difference. And if yeah. you just pop those on... Yeah, yeah, that's totally different. In what way is it different? It is more awakening. With, with the blue lights, it actually just brings you a bit more calmer, make you feel a bit more relaxed. But with the white lights, you, you feel awake straight away. Well, those are all the manufacturer's claims. Would the gadgets really yield great stress-busting results? We left our focus group to have a bit of a play with them, try the gadgets for size, and decide for themselves whether or not they actually worked. I find it quite painful on your ears. At first, it's quite strange with the flashing lights. Not my favourite one. Once you get used to it, it's quite relaxing. They're quite good. It doesn't seem very powerful because it's quite far away from your mouth. OK, the time has come for you to vote on which of your favourite stress-busting gadgets you've seen today, OK? So, raise your hands high if your favourite was John's Alpha Stim. Oh, I'm oh, crashing oh, zero. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh. Let's see if my oxygen bar can do any better. Raise them high. No! Oh! Hey, this is looking good. So it looks like a unanimous verdict in favour of Susie's Mind Spa. Hands in the air if that's your choice. I think it is. Well done, <laughs> Susie in the Mind Spa. Yay! Excellent work. Right, time for another short break now, but after that... Dallas and I continue our extreme sports challenge, testing some awesome surfing simulators and riding downhill far too fast on bicycles. <laughs> Welcome back. Now it's time to get straight on with the second part of our Extreme Sports Challenge. Yes, extreme as in me versus him yeah. versus take-no-prisoners type challenge. It was a challenge that would take us into areas angels fear to tread. Yeah, a place where all you need is guts, guts and some more guts. And protective clothing, obviously, to avoid bruising. And chafing. <laughs> Surfing is one of the most exciting, most extreme and most visceral sports around, but it's not massively techy. A board, some wax and a wave was all you needed until now. We'd each got a different gadget surf stimulator. My machine was something called a brush ramp. It replicates the feel of board sports, so snowboarding, skateboarding, and the reason I'm here? Surfing. Now, there are nine hundreds of these brushes which spin at about 450 RPM, creating a moving wall for your surfboard, giving you that big wave feeling. Whereas I was going to get wet on the board rider. Water is pumped through this hole by four huge turbines. It comes out of here at speed, hits this lip, and then forms what is called a sanding wave. And it's that on which I surf. All right, start them up. Having never surfed before, we had just two hours to practice on these machines before we'd have to perform in front of one of Britain's top surf judges, Esther Spears. Stay on your toes, man. Lean forward. Lean forward. I'm letting go, Chase. Well done. We were going to be marked just like a professional tournament, with our judge marking us out of ten for any manoeuvres we managed to pull off and our overall balance and control. Which was looking like a bit of a problem. So I'm down there. When yeah. I want to turn, I sort of stand up. Is that the no, idea? No, I'd stay low. I stay well, low. Put your hand on the machine if you want to, and then just pull the board. Both of these machines required supreme balance to stay upright, much like surfing itself. The brush ramp is a similar shape to a wave, 
The brushes moved in the same direction as the water would, forcing me up the slope while gravity was bringing me back down. By varying my balance and therefore the pressure of the board on the brushes, in theory, it's possible to move around, stay upright and even do tricks. Whereas on my board rider, it was the rushing water that was forcing me back towards the standing wave. I had to position my body just right so I didn't wipe out and end up on my backside in the surf. The brush ramp can be used to practice snowboarding and skateboarding as well as surfing. You just vary the size of the brush board accordingly. It's hard work too, a fantastic workout for the core muscles. I was exhausted. But my machine was specifically designed with surfing in mind. Perfect if you don't live near the sea. Two hours was quickly up and we'd had all the practice we were going to get. And we were shattered. Absolutely exhausting, it looks probably quite easy. It's like loads of these things, you're using a muscle group that you don't normally use in other activities. It's so tiring. Ooh, ooh, ooh. But this wasn't over. Now it was competition time, and we get just three runs each to impress Judge Esther Spears. I psyched myself up and headed out into the pool, but I think the pressure had got to me as I wiped out big style. And I didn't fare much better, lasting a matter of seconds before my board went flying. Second time round, we fared a little better, both demonstrating an improved level of balance and control. But neither of us had excelled. Neither of us had really done enough to earn the big points from our judge. Then it was run three, our last shot. We needed to combine the balance, stability and manoeuvres into one fluid routine. This was it, our last chance to impress. Amazingly, I pulled off my best run yet. My control and balance were spot on. This was it. I was surfing. I cracked it as well. It was tight and it was in control. And then I pulled my killer move, hanging 10, getting both my feet at the front of the board. Yeah, baby. Now it was in the judges' hands, but who would win the challenge? We'd have to wait to find out. Oh! oh nice shorts, <laughs> loving the shorts. Do you know what? <laughs> that really made me want to learn to surf, but I'd rather learn to surf on your simulator than the brushes that you had. Handy. No, the brushes are good. I mean, it was, it's hard work on the old brushes, but yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah, dive in Yeah, away. but that's surfing, man. Yeah, You've got to learn the moves. Cool. You've got to roll with the punches. Yeah, yeah you have. Yeah. Um, who thinks they won that competition? Because you had three Ooh, rounds. Wow. Yeah, the competition face on. How would you yeah. rate yourself? I would rate myself as being rubbish. I think I was a bit terrible. So it's, it's the difference between rubbish and terrible. OK, yeah. I've got those differences here. Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. Oh, so please. there were three rounds. Okay. In the first Tense. round, Dallas scored 4.5. Oh, oh, out of? Probably about 100. Oh, and that's a good score. <laughs> Not bad. Jason yeah. scored 5.5. Yeah. No! Okay. Oh. But two more rounds to go. In the second round, Dallas improved and he scored 5.5. Oh, my sure. Very yes. nice. Very good. But Jason got a bit better and no. scored 7.5. <laughs> So it was all down to the final round. <laughs> In the third round, Dallas scored 7.5. Oh, it's better, it's better. But Jason scored 9.5. No! 17.5, no! 22.5. Jason is our surfing champion. I did it! You're a dude, man. You're I'm a surf dude. dude. I do. I respect that. I respect your moves. Clearly, that's going to last some time. And it is time for this week's competition. But before I tell you what we are giving away, I thought it might be nice for you to know what it's like to win our competition. At the end of the last series, we gave away our biggest prize fund ever, 101 gadgets. And to see the face of the guy when the gadgets arrived in the lorry, we sent a camera along to catch his emotions. <laughs> this is Philip Henshaw, the lucky winner of the Gadget Show's greatest prize haul ever, one worth a staggering £28,000. He won an incredible 101 cutting-edge bits of tech, including three TVs, a high-end PC, a laptop, three mobile phones, three cameras, and all the gaming consoles on the market right now. A little lightsaber. Oh, it's all good. Kettle. It's Christmas. It's like Christmas, you see. This haul includes pretty much every gadget any self-respecting geek could ever desire, and now it all belongs to him. This is what I've been waiting for. It's Sky HD. Mint. This is wicked, look at that. There you go, Bill. Thanks. Excellent. They are wicked, aren't they? Just one phone call, 101 gadgets, and I've got them all. Thank you very much, Gadget Show. 
So now, if you're a little bit envious or even downright jealous of Philip, I think we've got the perfect remedy for you. Yes, because if you enter our competition, that there lorry could be trundling down your driveway very soon. You better believe it. It's a massive prize fund, and in my opinion, it contains just about every single gadget you could ever need to have your own house-based gadget festival. This week, you could win... A POV rugged camcorder. A Binatone 430 sat-nav system. A brand new iPod Touch. A Mine Lab Explorer SE metal detector. A Panasonic LS80 compact digital camera. And a Surefire E1 backup torch. A Symphony Beach Power Kite. A 50-inch plasma TV. A 32-inch LCD TV. And a 20-inch LCD TV. A Slingbox Pro. And an in-focus DLP projector. A 5.1 surround sound speaker system. And a Pyromat gaming chair. And a high-end desktop gaming PC. A MacBook Air. A Nintendo Wii and a Wii Fit and a DS Lite. A Microsoft Xbox 360. A Sony PS3 and a PSP. And a whole load of games for all those consoles. A pair of Yukon Tracker night vision goggles. A Solio Solar gadget charger. An Epson photo printer. An Oral-B Triumph electric toothbrush. A pair of Mordant short speakers. A high-def Blu-ray player. And 30 Blu-ray movies. A high-def Sony camcorder. And a Gorilla Pod. An iPod Classic. An Urban Mover electric mountain bike. A pair of Bose noise reduction headphones. An Alert Me Home security system. A pair of Wiley XSG1 sunglasses. A Berghaus Bioflex rucksack. A Coleman Road Trip Pro Barbecue. A Tefal Vita Cuisine. A Turbo Chef Blender. And a Hand Presso Wild. A pair of high-end Asics trainers. And an Adidas My Coach. A Leatherman Charge Multi-Tool. A G-Shock Golfman Watch. And a Pure Dab Radio. An 8-gig rugged USB memory stick. A Pocket Surfer. A Remote Control Vision Tracking System Camera Car. A Breville Blue Eyes Two Slice Toaster. A year's free subscription to Sky's Full HD service plus Dish and Decoder. And a year's free broadband at the best speed we can reasonably get where you live. And an appropriate Wi-Fi router. And £50 worth of calls a month free for a whole year on the 3 network and a Sony Ericsson K660i mobile phone. A cuddly toy with a hidden security camera inside. And a 7 foot 4 inch tiki surfboard. It's a massive prize fund worth 17 grand. And to be with the chance of winning everything you see before you, you need to know the answer to this question. Who played the lead roles in 1991 surf film Point Break? Was it A, Mel Gibson and Danny Glover? B, John Cusack and Alan Arkin? Or C, Patrick Swayze and Keanu Reeves. To enter, call 0904 1616 5 or text A, B or C to 63555. Calls cost £1.50 from a BT landline. Calls from other networks may vary and from mobiles will cost considerably more. Texts cost £1.50 plus one message at standard network rate. For rules, go to 5.tv slash win. Lines close at midday on Monday the 20th of October and we'll show you the question again at the end of the show. Good luck. Now it's time for another top five and this week it's all about having the perfect smile and minty fresh breath. I'm talking of course about the top five electric toothbrushes. Now, it's perfectly possible to give your teeth a thorough clean with an ordinary toothbrush, but let's face it, it takes a lot of elbow grease and the latest electric ones are a lot more efficient and a lot more fun. So, I've chosen five of the latest electrical tooth cleaning gadgets on the market and to help me decide which ones are best, I've come to the London Smiling Clinic and enlisted the help of one of our most celebrated dentists, Dr Euchenna Okoya, who just has fantastic transformations on 10 years younger. Euchenna, when it comes to cleaning our teeth, how should we do it? It's all about getting off the plaque, so it's using one that's going to be powerful enough, <laughs> that's going to be powerful enough to get rid of the plaque. To test each one, I ate a quick tasty snack of spinach and peach, mm, then brushed for two minutes. Euchenna then had a good look around my choppers and put our top five in order depending on how good a job they'd done. So, here's the rundown of our top five electric tooth cleaning devices. At number five, the Panasonic Denticare Travel Irrigator. Now, this one isn't a toothbrush, but it is a tooth cleaning gadget, and it claims uh, to do what dental floss does, but to clean more bacteria away from the tooth. You fill up its 165 millilitre reservoir with water and then the battery-powered motor squirts it out through a fine nozzle which you direct around your teeth. But it's a lot messier than a toothbrush. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. <laughs> it's hard to take it seriously. It is quite a powerful jet. I think you still need to brush. You still need to do the floss. There's no way that this is going to get rid of all the bacteria. 
At number four is the Colgate 360 Microsonic Power Toothbrush. So it looks like a normal toothbrush, but you press this button and then you get a vibration. Now, apparently, this is the only battery-powered sonic toothbrush on the market, which means that it has 20,000 vibrations per minute. Dentists advise that you should always brush your teeth for two minutes, but the Colgate's lack of timer meant I just had to guess. I can actually physically see the plaque still on your teeth, so... <gasps> <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> At number three is the Philips Sonicare, which comes with a special sanitizer unit that uses UV light to kill germs on the brush's head. It's got three different timing modes, a minute, a smart mode two minutes, and then it extends to three minutes. It vibrates at 31,000 strokes a minute, which helps dislodge plaque even in those areas where the brush can't reach. I think pretty good. Not too bad at all. At number two, it's the Oral-B Professional Care Rechargeable Toothbrush. A two-minute timer, so I know when the optimum time is up. It also comes with variable high to soft speed settings and a pressure sensor that cuts the motor if you press too hard much, much better. There's no spinach here at all. Plaque's gone. And I think you can feel the difference yourself, Yeah, you? I could. Yeah, definitely. It was, it was uh, stronger. And I think that one is supposed to polish your teeth as well. Yeah. But at number one, the Gadget Show's top electric toothbrush is the Oral-B Triumph with a Bluetooth smart guide display. It operates at 40,000 pulsations per minute. Going through my teeth, 40,000! The display tells you to clean your teeth for 30 seconds in each quarter of your mouth and also warns if you're pressing the brush too hard. And if you brush for more than two minutes... It's just awesome. And really, you know, if you're using this, it's got the power to get rid of the plaque. It's got the gadgetry to keep you motivated, and I just love it. What about that, then, the thoroughbred of electric toothbrushes? I absolutely love it. You know, the funny thing is... What? I mean, for a gadget fetishist like myself, you know, <laughs> these toothbrushes have always fascinated me, and, and I think this is a great piece of design. It's a beautiful thing. The differences between them actually were amazing. Oh, I mean, you could see from, her, from the dentist's reaction yeah. that, you know, that, that she really does rate this piece of technology. Of course, you mentioned the Bluetooth word. And from you that were point, in. I was sold. And they did get the spinach out of my teeth. It looked quite nice, though. It's a look. Right, time for the last break in tonight's show. But after that, the climax of our extreme sports challenge, when Dallas and I get dressed up in a whole load of body armour to test mountain bikes by riding them very quickly downhill. Welcome back. Time for the concluding part of this week's Extreme Sports Challenge. Yes, remember, we've already jumped off cliffs. We've almost drowned testing rugged camcorder equipment. Yeah, and I think it's fair to say that we mastered two surfing simulators. Yes, the score, as it stands, one apiece. That's right, deuce. Even Stevens. So, it was all to play for as we head into the final part, which was, I think it's fair to say, a scary, mm -hmm. can I use the word, hairy race. I can't watch. One of the most extreme sports out there is downhill mountain biking. They use some of the techiest bikes around to tear down tiny forest trails, which is what we were expected to do. This is going to be know. wicked. That is steep. It's very steep. That is steep. There's we're going to boulders. There's boulders. There's potholes. We're going to go fast. You know what? I actually saw one of the bikes. I wasn't supposed to through the open door of the van. Yeah. They're amazing. Yeah. I saw them get it out. They are beautiful, yeah. beautiful, prime downhill bikes. Look at the downhill gadget show extreme downhill. Oh, this is what it's all about. Look at that. We wanted to know if a super pricey, dedicated downhill machine was worth the cash, or if an everyday mountain bike would do the downhill job. I've got the best downhill bike around. The Trek Session 88 is built for tearing down a track. It's heavy, chunky and downright tough, but it comes at a price. As does mine, just a very small one. Second hand for £55, I've got this Muddy Fox mountain bike. Just the sort of thing a novice or an idiot might use in their first downhill foray. A half-mile course took us down the side of a big hill in Wales, over rocks and through mud and trees. So we padded up. This biofoam padded, high-impact, plastic-plated, chest, shoulder, back, elbow, forearm, knee and shin protection 
could make all the difference. Of course we weren't going to just fling ourselves down the hill willy-nilly. We needed to practice, so I went first. And soon I noticed just how different the trek was from a normal bike. The geometry is angled back at 63 degrees, which keeps my weight over the back wheel and firmly planted on the track. It's also amazingly heavy. This bike weighs 37 pounds, which gives me added stability. But the most amazing thing about this bike is the suspension. My front shocks have eight inches of travel, which stops my front wheel bouncing all over the place and send me flying. Most impressive, though, is the full floater system. Two springs in the middle of the bike keep the rear shock completely separate from any bumps the front forks hit, making me super stable. With Dallas's practice over, it was my turn to test out my old bone shaker. I'd done a bit of downhill in my youth, but it was taking all of my ability to hold on. My real problem here is the geometry of the bike. It's throwing my weight forward when it should be throwing it backward. So every time I hit a rock, with no suspension, of course, I've got to adjust my steering. Oh, I almost came off then. Oh, that was close. We'd both had a practice and got a feel for it. I was especially confident I'd sussed out my thoroughbred bike. With that bike, it's not like riding a normal street bike. That bike is a whole new technique you have to learn because there's so much suspension on it. Yeah. You have to learn to let the bike do the work. And when you're, you know, careering over rough ground, the bike can handle it. You just have to stay on. With the analysis done, it was time for the real thing. One shot, one chance at glory, one downhill race. Go on, go. Go on, Dallas. Pump those pedals, go on. My confidence was up and I really pushed. My practice had shown me how to ride this properly. I pedaled like mad into the first corner, changed gear and powered out. And it was here that I really appreciated the full floating suspension of the track. While the rear hinges took the sting out of most of the bumps, they were also firm enough so I could pedal without the bike wobbling all over the place. It was hard going, but in the end, I managed to rack up a time of 46.4 seconds. I lined up on the start, ready to oh. give it my all to beat Dallas and prove you don't need to spend a fortune to excel. I put all my strength into my start which was too much for my second-hand bike. The wheel reels come out, look. That, that's the problem with buying second-hand. The gear slipped, buckling the wheel against the frame. I made the repairs as best I could, reset the timer and went for it again. Go. This time the gears held and I launched myself downhill with scant regard for my own safety. It was hard to control the skittish bike as I gave it my all. The tyres were too thin and also I hadn't done a great job on the repairs. The wheel was rubbing against the frame and I was starting to lose control. Rounding the corner I hit a rock, lost my steering and headed face first into a bush. My weight being further forward Damn it. had caused me to come a cropper. I picked myself up and carried on but Dallas had the advantage. It's a seriously beautiful bit of kit, isn't it? Wait, are you, you crashing? Well, no, it's almost more like a motorbike. It's a bit like um, Kickstart. Right? It is a little Day kickstart. Round, round I do like it, though. I love the look of the thing. The it's aesthetics. awesome. But what an exhilarating challenge this really, week was, wasn't it? A great really way to end the, the challenge as well. I, mean, I tell you really? what, that bike, you can chuck yourself down a mountain on it and that bike's going to look after you. Oh, yeah, you yeah. can just chuck yourself down the mountain. <laughs> yeah. Look, or you over, did. Over the handlebars. In fact, <laughs> the only thing I thought as I flew over the handlebars was, where's Susie? Yeah, also flying over the handlebars. <laughs> Yeah, normally <laughs> next to when we have catastrophic <laughs> accidents. Well, well done this Thank week. You Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And that's yeah. pretty much all we've got time for on this week's show. But next time, quite a mysterious show. Oh, yeah, intrigue abounds. Oh, yeah. See you See next you week. Then.